Hi folks, and welcome to Analyzing Web Archives with the Archives and Leash Project. This workshop has been prepared by Ian Milligan and myself. Ian is the primary investigator for the Archives and Leash Project and has provided the many demo videos that you're going to see throughout. My name is Samantha Fritz and I am the project manager for the team and I'm going to be narrating today's workshop. This session will provide an overview of work by the Archives Unleashed team, specifically the tools built to help facilitate engagement with and increase access to web archives at scale. Together, we're going to walk through using the Archives Unleashed toolkit, first by getting our environment set up, and then we're going to run through some examples to explore the web archive data. Before we wrap up, there will be a quick overview of some of the common tools used by researchers in the digital humanities field, which you can then use to further explore the data we extract outside of the Archives and Leash Toolkit. So let's set the context for the session by first describing what web archiving is and why it's important. Taking a simple definition, web archiving is the deliberate process of preserving born digital content on the World Wide Web. In the almost two and a half decades since its launch, the web has impacted and transformed not only the way that we connect with one another, but how we produce and interact with information. As of October 2020, there are 4.66 billion internet users, which accounts for just under 60% of the world's population. And again, in 2020, 1.7 megabytes of data was created every second by every person. This points to the undeniable reality that the web continues to grow at an exponential rate. The bad news, though, is that even though there is growth, the web is disappearing, and I think we can all relate to the frustrating ex experience of encountering 404 errors. But while these incidents can seem like an inconvenience, there is a real danger in losing information, which essentially has no backup. And this is where we circle back to web archiving, because it allows us to preserve vulnerable and potentially significant cultural information in the form of born digital artifacts. Since 1996, various organizations and memory institutions around the world have participated in the web archiving process. In saving these collections, we as researchers and scholars and citizens have an opportunity to use this data to explore and interpret post-1990s topics. Despite the fact that we have 25 years worth of preservation, which amounts to petabytes upon petabytes of data, web archives present unique challenges of access and use to researchers. The abundance of data is a challenge, and this is largely because it can seem quite overwhelming to cope with the scale of data. But there are also some technical challenges. For instance, computational access at scale requires an understanding of high-performance computing. It also requires a familiarity with the command line. We know that scholars, too, are faced with time, resource, and support inadequacies. So the question that we're left with is, how do we lower this barrier of access and use? And this is really where the Archives and Leash project has excelled. The project was established in 2017 with funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and was born out of the need to create accessible and user-friendly tools to work with web archives. Our project team has developed a suite of open source tools, and today we're going to focus on and walk through how to get started with the Archives and Leash Toolkit, which was designed to access and analyze web archives at scale. To check out some of our other work, please visit archivesunleashed.org. The toolkit is built on Hadoop and Apache Spark, and analysis is done through the command line. The toolkit user documentation also provides dozens of example scripts, which you can use to modify to extract specific information when exploring web archive collections. We're going to run through a few different activities today uh, with the Archives and Leash Toolkit, and we're going to break it down into three easy steps. First, we need to set up Docker. We're then going to launch the toolkit, and then finally we're going to run through some example scripts to see what types of information we can extract. 
As we move through our material, we would just like to make an acknowledgement here that the data we're going to be using in our examples is from the Canadian Political Parties and Political Interest Groups Archivic Collection, which is collected by the University of Toronto. And if you'd like to learn more about this collection, you can view the link provided here. For each of our sections, we're going to present concepts and then we're going to play a short video from Ian that helps to illustrate those concepts in action, like so. So our first goal is going to get Docker set up and running. Docker is a tool that's been designed to easily run applications using containers, and essentially what this means is that all the parts of an application are packaged up. And we've chosen to use Docker for this workshop and indeed for many of our events because it's fairly easy to launch and it provides a consistent environment for teaching and learning. So if you already have a Docker account, please feel free to log in now. Uh, if you don't, you can sign up for a free Docker ID at docker.com. And once you've logged into your account, you can then download the appropriate OS install for Docker Hub. You're then going to continue to run through the install process. Uh, here we've just illustrated uh, those steps here. Uh, this will take a few minutes and just please note that all of our instructions, uh, both for the setup and then as we're walking through the toolkit, are being completed using a Mac environment. And just a reminder, depending on your system preferences, you may see a request for privilege access. So once the app has been installed and you're logged in, you're going to see an app icon on your desktop. Uh, in my case, it's going to be in the top bar of my screen. And here, when you click on the icon, you're going to see a green dot at the top that indicates Docker is running. And then if you glance down a bit, you can also see which account Docker is running on. To complete this step, we're going to do two quick additional checks just to make sure Docker is running as we expect it to. Uh, and we're going to be using two different commands that we've listed here. So we're going to start by opening our terminal window and we're first going to run Docker version. Uh, and this is going to provide information around the Docker version that's being used. And then our second command is going to be docker run hello world. And this command just verifies that Docker is pulling images and, and is running as expected. And with this second command, we are going to see, or you should see, a message in the terminal that Docker is running. So now that we have Docker running, it's time to launch the toolkit. We're going to start by creating a new directory or a new folder um, on your desktop and we're going to call it data. So you can either use your terminal window and I've listed the commands that you would use to do that uh, here um, or you can do a simple right click with your mouse on your desktop as Ian is demonstrating here. Please note the path for this file um, because we are going to need it for the next part. So as an example, Ian has created his directory on the desktop, so uh, his path is going to read like so. Now we can launch the toolkit through a Spark shell, and this is going to take a few minutes. So we're going to modify that script that's provided up at the top to include the path to the data folder that you just created. So we're going to substitute what's been highlighted uh, for the path of the directory that you just created. So the script in our example is going to read like so. And please make sure to keep that colon. It is not a mistake. The command that we're using is going to make a connection between the directory you just created with a directory in the Docker virtual machine called Docker.
So as you wait for the toolkit to load, uh, we just have a few quick tips to share. First, we suggest that you use a text editor for copying, pasting, and editing scripts. Uh, this is just to help avoid some of those text formatting issues that can come up. And then we've also included some commands that you're going to be needing for SparkShell. So the first one, uh, the paste command is needed for when you're copying over scripts. Um, and yes, you do need that colon. When we're ready to exit the paste mode, uh, which will then execute the analysis that we've asked for, you're going to use control D. This command uh, can also be used once you're ready to exit the toolkit completely. Uh, and just a quick note as well, all of the scripts that we're going to be running are available through our user documentation. So if you'd like to have a window open um, to the documentation as well to help follow along or you know, experiment, you're more than welcome to do so as well. So let's jump into some analysis. We're going to start with a script that deals with collection analytics. And this is a really great way to get a sense of how the collection is shaped. This first script is also fairly simple and lets us know that the toolkit is working. So just a quick breakdown of what's happening with this script and what it's doing. The first two lines are going to import the aught libraries or the toolkit libraries. Next, we're going to point to where the data can be found. For us, we're using some sample data, but if you have some uh, works or some web archive collections that are located on your desktop or elsewhere, you can point to them um, at this stage. And then following, we're saying that we only want to keep valid pages. So in this case, it's going to be the HTML data. And then finally, we tell the toolkit that we'd like to extract domains, uh, which is going to find the base domain for each URL. And then it's going to count how many times it appears in the collection. We've also asked uh, specifically just to display the top 10, but of course this number can change. Now it's your turn to try it out. Again, with the script, we're asking for the toolkit to return the top 10 URLs that are occurring across the Web Archive collection. And if you'd like to experiment a little bit, uh, please feel free to change uh, the number 10. So let's watch Ian's demo. And remember, once you've pasted your script, you're going to need to press Control D uh, for the toolkit to execute the results. Now, your results are going to be shown in the terminal window, uh, which you can then copy elsewhere to continue to work with. And what you should see is the results listed in a string. So you're going to have a bracket uh, with a URL followed by a number, and this is the, the, the count for that URL. We can also take a look at plain text extraction. This next script is going to pull in all of the plain text from our work collection, uh, and it's going to save it as a text file to the data directory that we created earlier. It's really, really important that you have the pathway correct, just so that the, the toolkit knows where to save the file. When the analysis is completed, you're going to find uh, three text files in your data directory, uh, and then we can take these files and use them with other tools for, for instance, uh, for textual analysis. So let's see it in action. And then once that analysis is done, you can go into your data file and take a look at the results. We can also generate results that pull from focused domain URLs. 
So the following script is going to generate a plain text rendering for all of the web pages in a collection with a URL matching uh, a filter string. So in this case, we're only considering uh, the plain text from the liberal.ca domain. And again, we've asked for the output to be saved to our data directory. So as you go through an experiment, uh, we're just going to note here that there are many different filters that can be used. These are just some common examples. So for instance, um, the toolkit permits you to filter records um, by a list of either a full or a partial date string. So we use the keep date to specify whether it's a year, um, it can be a year and a month, a year month date, or you can select multiple years to filter through. As we've noted with the past exercise, uh, we can generate plain text renderings for all of the web pages in a collection um, with a URL matching a regular expression pattern. So using the keep URL patterns, you can filter, for instance, um, by one URL. So in this case, uh, www.davidsuzuki.org, or you can uh, filter by multiple URLs. And as a final example here, we can also apply a language filter. So our example here is keeping only English language pages, uh, but the filter does use the ISO language codes, so you can uh, change that as well. Another area of interest for researchers could be site link structure. And this can be useful for understanding and exploring questions like what websites were the most linked to, what websites had the most outbound links? What are some of the paths that can be taken throughout the network to connect to pages? And then even what communities existed within the link structure? With this script that we've provided, uh, we're going to create a GEXF file. And this can be then used directly in the Gephi software suite, which is an open source network analysis project. Um, and we'll be doing a really quick walkthrough of Gephi in just a bit. But like our text files from earlier, this GEXF file will be saved directly to your data directory. The toolkit also supports image analysis, which is a growing area of interest within Web Archive research. The script you'll work with uh, extracts the most frequent image URLs in a collection, um, and it's really important here to note that we're extracting the image URLs and not the actual images themselves. Um, and again, you can adjust how many items the toolkit uh, is counting. For this example, we've asked for the top 20. And the output looks very similar to the others that we've been working with. So you'll have in brackets um, the image URL followed by a count. And if you wanted to work with these images further, you could, for instance, use the Wayback Machine to view the temporal distribution. So, for instance, we can simply copy and paste that image URL uh, that's been provided by the toolkit uh, into the Wayback Machine and then start exploring like Ian has done here. So to round out our workshop, our final script will provide a slightly different output. So up until now, we've been working with Resilient Distributed Datasets, or RDD, and now we're going to switch over to data frames. So taking a look at a script that we ran earlier, so listing uh, the top domains, um, we're going to process it with data frames. So here the results now, instead of a string, um, are presented in a tabular format with the same information that we saw before. So on the left-hand side, we're going to have a column that lists the domains. And then in the right-hand column, we're going to have the uh, accounts for each of those domains. And we can see how data frames can be helpful as we get into some more in-depth image analysis.
So for instance, this script here extracts information from the web archive collection, um, but provides several different columns of information, which um, as we can see here is quite a bit easier to view in data frames. So that's just um, an introduction to some of the scripts that you can use um, with the Archives Unleashed Toolkit. And we do encourage you to explore uh, a bit more and experiment. Um, and for more examples of scripts that you can use, uh, please visit the Toolkit user documentation. For our final piece to this workshop, we're gonna shift gears a bit. So the Archives Unleashed Toolkit generates some really useful data files, but you're probably wondering, what do you do with them now? And so we're gonna take a brief look at two tools, one for text analysis, one for network analysis, that are complementary to the data that we've extracted from the toolkit. So the first tool that we're going to look at is Voyant. It is a free web-based tool used for text analysis and exploration. It's easy. Uh, all you have to do is upload your text, your zip, or your PDF file, and it provides a, a variety of different search analysis and visualization functionality. As we can see with this dashboard here, Voyant allows you to quickly and easily visualize your data. Uh, it gives you a high level overview of your text just to get a sense of what you might want to further explore. But then it also offers the ability to really dig down into the data. Earlier, we extracted uh, all the text from the captures of the liberal.ca website with our sample data. Uh, we generated that text file, and now we can actually upload that text file right into Voyant to perform some basic analysis. So for instance, we can use the links tool uh, to visualize context relationships between frequently used words. We can also use the trends tool uh, to graph the frequency of keywords throughout the text. Voyant's uh, context tool allows you to quickly view on keywords um, and then see several words to the right and the left of it, which helps further place uh, the context for your keywords. So here's a little demo from Ian on using Voyant with our text file uh, extracted using the toolkit. Text analysis only gives us a small dimension of web content. Um, and so we can take a look at network analysis to help view some of the interconnection, the significance, uh, the interaction, even community that's happening within our data. And for this, we turn to Gephi, which is an open source software for graphing and visualization. Um, it does provide free downloads for Mac, Windows, and Linux users. Um, and what we're going to show here really is only a teaser of some of the potential uses um, for Gephi in understanding archived web collections. 
uh, Archives Unleashed has a full learning guide on Gephi, um, but Gephi also has several tutorials and extensive documentation um, for those who are new to network analysis. So again, we can take that GEXF file that we created earlier and we can open it in Gephi to start to explore. We can and we can use the statistics and the filters tool to help us organize and visualize the data. Let's watch a quick demo from Ian on how to transform that GEXF file we generated with the toolkit to something a little bit more refined within Gephi. As we wrap up here, we've highlighted through this workshop that web archives are an important data source for anybody who's studying topics post-1990. And our project highlights that it's critical to provide researchers and scholars with methods and tools to access and use web archives. We designed the toolkit to provide transparent and flexible options for exploring web archives, and we do hope that you continue to experiment with the toolkit. Our team is always excited to hear about the different ways um, that our tools have been applied to web archives research, uh, and we hope you join our community. We have listed here a number of different resources that are freely available for your use, um, from our toolkit user documentation to different learning guides. We've also posted sample projects uh, from our past datathons, and hopefully they can help to inspire and spark interest for your own research. Uh, and then finally, here we've listed the number of different ways that you can connect with our team and our user community. Thanks so much for joining.